Okay, so I am a uh, second year PhD student. I'm supervised by Dr. Mente, um, and I'll be talking about um, time trends of dietary consumption uh, around the world. Uh, so this is a systematic review uh, that we've been working on um, and large contributions from uh, Dr. Yusuf and Dr. Uh, Degan from uh, PHRI. So a bit of a background on this. So. Suboptimal nutrition, uh, as you know, is a major modifiable risk factor um, for many uh, diseases globally. And in the past century, there's been major shifts, um, both in diet and lifestyle. Um, and, you know, there's many contributing factors to this. Um, so, for example, you know, socioeconomic development um, modern food trade, food industry marketing and also policies. Um, and so it's, it's important for us to track changes over time um, because we can evaluate both past and, and plan future nutritional initiatives and policies. And when publications in the past have looked at trends, uh, they continuously rely on supply level data. And so supply level data um, is, for example, the unit would be like kilograms uh, per year imported. Um, and so it's, it's the least reliable for actual intake. Um, and a lot of the work that we've seen uh, has been in North America and Europe. Um, so we wanted to do more of a broad uh, look at trends. So it, um, our objective was to look at both uh, trends in macronutrients, energy, uh, and also foods. But today I'll be focusing on macronutrients and energy uh, for the sake of time. Uh, but we have also looked at trends in specific food items like uh, dairy uh, or meat. Um, and this is specific to individual level dietary assessments. So like food frequency questionnaires or 24 hour recall, uh, where you're actually asking a person and not necessarily looking at um, like imports um, and other sort of uh, country level factors. Um, and we, we used um, so three large databases. Also because of the nature of the data, we had to look at many organizations and national statistical web pages uh, because sometimes trends might be you know, hiding, for example, on Stats Canada and not necessarily in a publication. Uh, so it's important to add that in to this type of review. Uh, where possible, we did national surveys. Um, if there wasn't a national survey, then we went to more of a community-based smaller survey. And so most of them are national that we looked at and they include like thousands of people. Um, if we had to rely on a smaller survey, um, that happened uh, fairly rarely. So uh, we did have a minimum of 100 participants, but that uh, you never see like 100 participants in one of these surveys. Um, and we looked at this both um, really visual from visual, uh, a few visual techniques. And also for the modeling, we use a linear mixed effects model. Um, so we're estimating the change in energy and macronutrients per decade um, and by region. Um, and this allows us to compare on a sort of a standardized unit because we're looking at per decade. And we, um, we did some sensitivity analysis, for example, for what type of dietary assessment method they used. Um, also the median age of the country changing over time, uh, because we know that age can impact some of these trends and also the first year of measurement. So we screen more than 50,000 articles um, and other, other resources, um, you know, we went through the typical systematic review process where we ended up off was um, with 41 countries um, uh, for a total of 97 resources uh, because a country can have um, you know one survey but it might be reported in three publications and we wanted to capture the data um, all of the data in points that we we're interested in in terms of study characteristics so about a third was from uh, the Asia and Pacific region. Um, we have quite a bit of data from Europe. So this, this was expected because uh, we knew there was a lot of um, nutrition surveys uh, in Europe. Um, North America was about 5%, uh, and that's because it's Canada and US. So that was two countries out of the 41. Uh, we did get, um, we were able to capture some data from Middle East and Latin America, um, but still a lot less um, than the, um, the Asia region and the Europe region. 
Most of them, most of the studies were cross-sectional surveys. Uh, this was expected because, for example, they, they surveyed diet in 1990 and then they surveyed diet in 2010, but they don't use the same people. Uh, it might still be nationally representative, but it wouldn't be the same people because that's not very feasible. Uh, most of the surveys are 24 hour or a combination uh, of 24 hour recall. And we do also see some food frequency questionnaires and uh, diet reports. Um, and this also, the reason you see these differences as well is because when you're capturing um, older studies, you the methods have have changed. Um, and a lot of a lot of the 24 hour recall is a quick uh, a quick method. And so if you're doing a national survey, um, it's important to have uh, usually a faster a faster method. So. I'll walk you through this graph because it can be a bit overwhelming at first, but on, so we have the countries here at the bottom. Um, so for example, Singapore, and each of these lines is a trend line. So whatever data that country had on energy intake, uh, we were able to capture and create this trend line. And so this is specific to total energy intake and it's shown as um, calories. And so, um, and the reason we showed this all together was because you can actually compare uh, different countries simultaneously, and you can also look at different regions uh, simultaneously in a way. So the first, you know, 13, 13 countries are this um, Asia and Pacific region, and we have a few um, Middle East and Latin America countries, and then a lot of data from Europe um, with some data from North America and um, New Zealand and Australia. So. So generally what you can see, um, and just to comment that this orange dot is the most recent survey, um, and that's always after the year 2005. So it's an estimate of kind of the most recent intakes. Um, so between, you know, like the last 10 years uh, that we're looking at pretty much here. Um, so you can compare this orange dot um, across the different countries. Um, so generally what we see is that um, energy intake is lower in the Asia region compared to um, the other regions that we have. And we see a bit of a, a mixed trend where about half of the Asia countries increased their intakes of energy, whereas half decreased. For um, the North America, Europe, Middle East region, pretty much all of the countries have decreased their energy intake, um, except for the United States. And this is uh, since about 1960 to current day. Um, so if you if you compare from like the first year measured, um, you do see an increase in energy um, over time. So moving on, the next one is carbohydrate intake. And I think um, as expected, you see higher um, carbohydrate intake in the Asian Pacific region. Um, and this is based both on, you know, over time and also on the most recent measurement. Um, and what's interesting as well is you can start to see, for example, like Vietnam, Philippines, and India, um, their changes are much, uh, are much lower. Um, and this is largely linked to um, GDP uh, differences. Um, so the poor countries have much less change um, as we see in most, um, most of the trends that we've looked at. Um, and still quite, quite high intakes at about 75% of total energy from carbohydrates. Within the, the Europe region, we see um, a bit of a mixed trend. So more Northern Europe has decreased their carbohydrate, whereas the other regions within um, Europe, North America, we see some, um, some increases. And I think this is, you'll expect to see the opposite for fat. So uh, because carbohydrate and fat really um, end up being um, like when you have high carb, you have low fat and vice versa. Um, what you can see is quite large uh, increases over time in the Asia region. Um, and, but their intakes are still um, a lot lower than um, the other regions that we measured. And as I mentioned, um, the, Northern, the Northern Europe, um, they had the decrease in carbs. So they had the increase in fat um, and that's, <clears throat> That's largely encapsulated uh, here. 
What you can also look at is the last one that I'll discuss is protein. Um, and just to note that the protein change is um, is a lot lower. So, you know, we might have gone from 10% of energy to 15. Um, so it changes a lot less than uh, the carbohydrate and the fat intakes. Um, and so a lot of a lot of the countries have increased their protein intakes, um, especially you see this in the Asia region. Um, for example, Vietnam, this is um, considered to be a positive change uh, because this will is a marker as well of um, a lot of the child and maternal um, outcomes, like for example, stunting or wasting. Um, so uh, that's one one of the ways that you can actually use this data um, in tracking past policies and future policies. And I'll go on to when you actually look at this with the mixed effects model. So now this is the change in the macronutrient intakes per decade. Um, so we're looking at a standardized unit. Um, and so you'll see the carbohydrate in the black, um, the fat in the purple, and the protein in this gray. What you'll notice is that the carbohydrate change is always larger than that of the fat change. Um, so for example, in the Asia region, uh, carbohydrates decreased by about 3% of energy per decade, and fat um, increased by about uh, a little over 2% of energy per decade. But it's important to also, so we had the change, but we also have to look at the last year. Um, so for example, um, the Asia region and also uh, Latin America. So they're decreasing their carbs and increasing their fat. But if you look at the most recent estimates, they are still the two regions that have the highest carbohydrate intake. And this is another example of how we can use this data. So um, there's many um, large cohort studies that find after carbohydrate uh, increases past about like 60% of energy, they, it was associated with an increase um, an increase, uh, increased risk of mortality. Um, so that's another example of how you can use this data. If you if you start to see certain countries, um, for example, Middle East are starting to increase or East Europe are starting to increase their carb, uh, we might be worried that they might go past um, that 60% of energy from carbs. And I do want to make a note that um, the foods are really important to look at. Um, so I only presented the energy and macronutrients for the, for the sake of time for this presentation, but it's really important to actually look at the foods. Um, so whether that fat is from a cake um, or from an increased um, meat is also important because there's different uh, background nutrients to those, those foods. So there are a few limitations um, really with any of this kind of ecological work, especially, uh, but especially with time trends as well. Um, so things have for sure changed over time, um, including the methods of dietary assessment. Um, it's, it's quite difficult to access data prior to 1960. And even if you access it, um, there's some questionable uh, quality. Um, and there are, you know, trends might differ by different subpopulations. So within a country, we know that there's differences by urban and rural. Um, but because I was looking uh, to compare across different countries, um, I didn't put that level of detail um, into these graphs. Um, but we know that, you know, the, the rural uh, regions are much slower to change, for example, like really high carbohydrate intake. Um, so what makes this unique is that it's the first review that actually looked at individual level intake um, and it tried for a global scale. Um, we did capture 41 countries or, you know, many other countries that weren't captured, um, which also speaks to the availability of um, actually tracking nutrition over time. Um, and we're working on trying to see if we can find um, additional resources that we might not have captured with our search. Um, so it's an ongoing process as well. Um, so as I mentioned, um, the Asia region that we that we had, um, so they still have the highest carbohydrate and lowest fat intakes, um, but there were large decreases in carbs and increases in, in fat and protein. Um, we saw a bit of heterogeneity in the, the Europe, North America, Australia region, um, for example, where North Europe um, decreased their carbs and increased their fat, whereas the other regions had the opposite. And um, although limited data in Middle East and Latin America, we saw 
we did see some um, some trends there. Um, so, for example, Middle East with the increased carb um, and the decreased fat, um, and they both increased uh, their protein. Um, and this has numerous imp implications uh, for policy. And also we can compare, um, we can look at large cohort studies that actually looked at these dietary exposures. And we could think about, you know, if, if um, carbohydrates is increasing by this amount, we're expecting to see this uh, potentially with um, with outcomes. Um, so that's also where uh, where this work is going. Um, so thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions.